今天晚上呢，我们非常高兴的邀请到了呃一个很受家长和学生欢迎的呃 coach coach counselor 啊、呃、，her name is Anne。啊、呃，他呢，首先呢是 evaluator 在 Princeton University 啊、呃，他大概有十年多的经验在 counseling 的 experience 上面。同时呢，因为他非常的亲和力很强，等一会儿您可以啊、呃、领略到他的风采哈、啊。所以我们的学生经常会跟他 building a very strong relationship 啊、呃，在他的这个指引下面呢，会比较 positively、happily 呃接受这样的一个 guidance， 去完成他整个 high school 呃过程当中的。对 college 的 understanding， 对 college application 的 understanding， 同时达到一些 gap filling。啊，呃 ，Anne 呢是杜克大学的 graduate， 同时在 Rutgers University 啊、uh, finish her MBA。他今天的话题呢是集中的去解读 holistic review 的这个整个的体系，因为他在培训大学做了很多年的 evaluator 和 reader， 所以呢他有大量的这个呃这个 data 和 experience， 可以帮助我们一起来揭秘。啊，平顺学生录取评分体系的这样的一个呃、啊、背后的这样的一个体系哈、啊，同时呢，他会呃、啊、跟我们大家分享他是如何帮助孩子们来挖掘兴趣点啊，同时尊重孩子的 specialty 和他们的 strength 和 positioning 啊，未来的专业方面啊，他也会帮助孩子们去探究到底哪些专业对他们来说是感兴趣的，同时也是适合的啊。第四个呢，就是他会来分享一下他是如何培养和激发孩子的。升学的内驱力啊，就让小孩子自己本身 happily 去啊、嗯，跟着这个导师一起去把这个整个升学的过程做得比较 smooth。Hi everyone, I'm Anne, and I am working with Ivy Compass. I am an independent college counselor,、um, and I am going to share my screen and walk you through a presentation of what I do in this role,、um, and then I know we're going to move to questions after that. Understand, folks are from all over、um, the country. So,、um, one thing which I'll get into is I do counsel students from coast to coast. So,、uh, you know, I work with right now. I'm working with、um, a student in Palo Alto.、Um, you know, all over the place.、Uh, get get to knowing all different types of school districts and schools、um, and all different learning experiences. Okay, so here we go. A little bit about me. I kind of heard Sophia. Um, a little bit explain some things. So、um, I have been doing full time college consulting for coming up on ten years.、Um, my experience was、um, at Princeton University in admissions as being a reader,、um, which was a really fascinating experience because I read for New Jersey and got a really great sense. I live in New Jersey, a really great sense of a wide, wide, wide variety. And then after reading for New Jersey, you read for the whole country. So then I got a great sense of the entire country and all of the people applying to Princeton.、Um, so、um, that was really foundational in the way I approached this work.、Um, so、uh, I worked.、Um, I'm a senior associate with Betterton College Planning, which is a company、um, run by my father, who has been doing this work for 30 years. And so we collaborate occasionally. He's a really great resource. Um, I also bring my personal life to this work,、um, so I, you know, work with all different types of students, doing all different types of high school work.、Um, but I also have two children of my own. My daughter、um, is just graduating from Williams College right now, which is an incredibly elite、uh, liberal arts college in Massachusetts,、um, and she was a recruited athlete. So I'm very familiar with the recruited athlete experience. I've lived it, and I have counseled. Numerous、uh, Division One, Division Three recruited athletes across multiple sports.、Um, my son is now a sophomore at Reed College,、um, and he、uh, chose Reed, and also we were able to get him、um, a merit scholarship there. So he, they are totally opposite children.、Uh, super hard charging athlete,、um, and then a kind of not interested in sports at all. Kind of a a person who followed his bliss in different ways. And it worked out for both of those children in very unique and different ways,、um, with really great outcomes, despite them being completely different human beings in every possible way.、Um, I personally、uh, went to Duke University a hundred million years ago. It feels like、uh, a long time ago, and I was also a recruited athlete. I don't actually normally share that information, but.、Um, 
so I was a recruited athlete for field hockey. So I've also had the personal experience. So it was a long time ago. Um, and then when my children were very young, I went back for um, an MBA at Rutgers University, which is about a mile from my home. I'm very familiar with it. And it is a great university that often does not get its due in the college application process. Um, the my If you read my full bio, you know that my husband, not to be giving you my family tree, but it is it is part of all of this. He is a high school history teacher in my town. He teaches AP classes. He is also an athletic director. He was also a recruited athlete. Um, and he is a bit of a secret weapon for me. He's very tapped into what's going on in high schools, what's going on in guidance departments, in um, all the minutia that your child is engaged in in their schooling. He has become a really wonderful resource for me um, to bounce things and get an inside scoop on. And that's a big help as well. And so he, he gets asked questions every single day by me on behalf of my students. Um, so let's talk. Um, Sophia is telling me that this group is very sophisticated in terms of your knowledge about um, the competitiveness of college. And um, it is competitive. Um, supply and demand is a big part of that meaning that um, very few universities are adding spots to their incoming freshman class. Um, I live about 45 minutes from Princeton University and they are actually building two new um, colleges within Princeton, which I think are only going to add about 200 new spots. So they're building these giant structures and only being able to bring on 200, 300 new students. Um, and so they're a really small freshman class. They're doing massive construction to, to grow the size of their university. And yet it's still a very small incremental increase. So this takes a long time for these spots to, um, to be created by different universities. And of course, as you know, the uh, popularity of US university, universities is, is, is uh, more popular than it has ever been, um, even from year to year. Um, what we see is folks like me, uh, folks like Ivy Compass and, and very wise parents getting ahead of this process with their own students and getting savvy and, and knowledgeable about this and kind of lining up ways for their student, the child, their, their high schooler to do as well as possible, which is why you're on this, on this uh, webinar. And what we end up seeing is something we call academic bunching, where students are all doing really well in almost all of the same ways. And it then becomes very difficult to figure out who's who in that grouping and who's doing what and who's really, how are they going to pick? How are admissions folks going to pick from a huge bunch of very, very high achieving students that look very similar in many ways? Um, the other thing that a lot of folks don't talk about when it comes to college admissions, they're always focused on the student and they're always focused on what that student is going to bring to the college. What I like to talk about is the admissions office, and that usually falls under the enrollment office at a university, is that their priorities may be very different. And they are unknown. They are always unknown to us, to any outsider. So what you have is uh, uh, folks making decisions and trying to create a class of incoming first years or freshmen. And they are prioritizing things like legacy candidates. They are, and legacy gets a lot of, uh, of press, but in fact, recruited athletes are a more, uh, special class of, of um, incoming freshmen that gets treated much more um, specially and gets allotted many, many, many more of the spots than people are really aware of. Um, there are also admissions officers and admissions and enrollment folks are looking for, they're looking at their current group of students who just graduated how many different students are looking at which different majors, how many men, how many women, how many folks are not identifying in a specific gender, what's the rate, racial and cultural, where are people from the geograph, geography of the United States and across the, the world, um, and what is the financial need of the class, 
um, there are uh, endless number of factors where admissions folks are trying to allocate space within a small group of incoming freshmen in order to meet the needs of the university, and we don't always know what those are. And so that is a further complication to the competitive nature of this process that isn't spoken about very much. Um, so this is what the array of colleges look like in the United States. There are 2,000 four-year colleges, and most families that I work with fall between the most selective schools, the top 25 into the 75, and sometimes dabbling in the top of the 250 competitive schools. Um, I do work with students, you know, which um, across all of these categories, but certainly most are coming because they are interested in or have the student is showing ambition or the family is ambitious to get into a more selective quote unquote prestigious college. Um, so that's what the array looks like. And as you can imagine, there's no secret sauce. You have probably heard of those 25 colleges. You have probably heard of many of the 75 and even some of the 250. So sometimes people, families come wanting something kind of unique and different, and they're just not that many colleges. And so the pool, again, remains really small and is not changing. And so this is a slide where I have most parents, if I could see you, and most students are leaning in because this is the credential of the students that are admitted to these schools. So over here, we'll start with the top 25 most selective schools. You have students who, and this is where the bunching comes in, they all look like this. Every student, many, many, many students who apply to these top 25 schools look exactly like this. They have an A or an A plus average, and we're talking about like a 99, 100% average in all of their classes. They are taking the hardest courses in that their school has to offer, and they are also um, most likely taking some type of outside of school, college, summer, sometime, some type of other academic um, enrichment um, that involves official college courses or something like that. They probably have pretty close to perfect SATs and ACTs. And here's the thing, which I'll dig deeper into in a slide or two, is they have unusually strong activities and talent and personal. Um, and so then you're talking about the next 75 schools being just off of that. So an A average, almost all honors and AP classes, very good SAT or ACT scores, and still very interesting students outside of their academics. They're involved in their community. They have leadership. They may have a talent. And then finally, we've got, I won't get into the 1650 because many of these have a pretty low, um, pretty high admit rate, but even these 250, which are considered competitive colleges, have a uh, about a 50% admit rate, and they are, um, you know, students really have to be good students. They, they have to be trying, they have to be working hard. They might not be great test takers, so their test scores fall around a 1280 to a 1460, and they are still um, active. We would call them, you know, engaged students in their community and in their school. They're not doing nothing. They're certainly engaged. Um, and so that's the array. That's what everyone kind of looks like. And that's the credentials that you need in order to even be in the zones to compete in those schools. Um, so what I do, um, the, the thing I think that's most helpful about what I do is I use my role as an admissions uh, reader to be your admissions officer for every college. So I can play that role. I can assess a student and look at what their academic and personal um, sides look like. And I'm gonna get into that and show you exactly what I mean. And then I can be the admissions officer and I can tell you with a lot of accuracy when a student um, gets assessed by me, what their matching colleges are. Um, and then, and that's kind of one part of the process. And it's one that is a deeper, richer, um, predictive model than most college counselors can offer. Um, so let's get into what that looks like. So every college assesses the student, the incoming um, applicants, around just the same criteria I showed you before. 
We've got the academics, which is the GPA, a class rank, courses and grades, test scores, and, and, and honors. Um, and then we've got the extracurricular side of it or the personal side, which are school related groups like newspaper, student council, model UN, those are you know US school examples. Um, talent, like being a recruited athlete, being an artist or having some outside talent that's, that's extra um, special. There's outside of school um, activities like scouting, religious connected, you know, to your, your um, house of worship, deep paid work, internships, research. Um, there's also volunteering, which we make it its, its own category because it's really important and really valued by admissions officers. And then also leadership. And leadership can be its own thing or it can cut across all of these categories. And then we've got the personal uh, um, meaning, meaning who is this student and who is, um, how is the reader of the application really understanding who this person is. And that comes through in the teacher recommendations, the guidance counselor's recommendation, any optional recommendations that the school allows uh, a student to submit, and all of the essay writing that the student um, puts together. And so that's where um, uh, a, these kind of softer pieces of a student's application, like their humility, um, their growth, um, their um, commitment, you know, their, their being a, a nice person, frankly, a contributor to the, the campus that they'll be attending comes through in hopefully a really strong way. Now, of course, as you know, there's only, no one has control over all of the pieces of this puzzle. So the student is responsible for all of the academic work. The student is responsible for the extracurricular pieces and then also needs support from family in order to make that happen. The essays are the student with support from a counselor like me coming up with really great topics and really making sure that those essays are hitting the mark. But the teacher recommendations are never seen by the student, by the counselor, and by the parent. And so that's a little bit of an area that we work on ahead of time. We keep top of mind. We know the student, we, we, I remind students, hey, it's your junior year. These academic teachers will be your recommenders. So think about how to connect with them. Think about investing time and energy with these recommenders so that they're writing you a good recommendation and that this isn't just a thing you do at the end. You know, this isn't something you just fill out a form and go ask this teacher. What I try to do is get my students to cultivate a relationship with their junior year teachers, to be really present for that, to be active in their classes, and then decide of those five teachers who are going to be the two that are going to get the recommendations. And I think that extra focus, that extra awareness is really important in this process. Okay. So next, this is the academic rating. So again, no mystery in all of this. This is shared. This is a document that's shared with my students um, to both um, assess them by me. And also I share this document with students so that I actually, when I do the presentation of a rating, I actually do a, an actual PowerPoint presentation with my students. And I show you, I show the student, I circle the area. So say you have a student with an A minus um, grade point average here but they're taking the most demanding classes, this part would be circled. Their SAT scores are, you know, kind of maybe here in the 1320. Um, they're taking some APs and maybe they're here in a three, four. We average out what this score will be. Um, and then we also talk about how to move on this chart. And we're always trying to move up the chart and academically moving as much up the chart as possible is best. So we try to um, do some planning, do some strategizing. This column of course selection here is ending up being pretty important. And we spend, especially when I start with a ninth grader or 10th grader, the course selection discussions that are happening right now um, in, in schools, um, picking your courses for the next year are big important discussions. I also pick multiple, we, we, we pick one year, but we're looking all the way into 12th grade and mapping out a course for the for maximizing the courses that you can take. 
And sometimes that that means a summer school course. Sometimes it means um, a student taking, you know, figuring out a different pathway through in order to follow through and take the hardest classes that the school has to offer. So smaller schools are a little more challenging. Larger schools can also be challenging because they can restrict the number of students who can take AP exams, all of this stuff. We figure it all out, we work it all out, and we look at the full array of years left in the student's high school experience in order to be sure at the end of the day, if that student wants to be able to or can apply to a certain type of school, that that student has the coursework needed to do that. And so that's a big um, undertaking with a nice big spreadsheet that shared with the family and a lot of discussion. Um, and then this is what the personal chart looks like. Um, and this one's harder, you know, so I'll share kind of as in the in the vein of being really um, transparent and truthful about this process. And here's where the competitive part comes in. Students, almost all students that I begin to meet with who are ninth and 10th graders are a four. And that's a little alarming to people because this means that they are a pretty good high school citizen. They're involved in some clubs and activities. They um, may have a thing or two that they're doing outside of school. They're doing some typical volunteering. They're usually too young to have leadership if they're in ninth and 10th grade. And we hope that they're nice people who are going to develop some good personal characteristics. When we get into junior year and senior year, a five is a pretty standard. This is a five is a high school superstar, someone who is really engaged in the high school really uh, doing some leadership in junior into senior year, very um, uh, uh, involved, connected, and taking leadership roles. And then lastly, we've got a six who is someone who can get beyond the school, beyond, um, you know, we look at, as you can see here, you've got school, you've got county league, you've got region state, and then you've got international national. These uh, hierarchies here show you kind of the competition. So when we're, we're talking, I've never given anybody an eight, by the way, and I don't, I think I've given one seven. So that's pretty extraordinary stuff happening at these uh, levels. And it's usually students come in at about a six or a 6.5. And those are the students that are really connecting into deep, engaging activities and are pushing beyond the boundaries of their high school um, in order to, to, to get to another level of connectedness with their activity. And I'll share that almost no student ever accomplishes that without help. So they need my advice or Ivy, and or Ivy Compass's advice, and they also need parent support to do that. So when I counsel students and the parent says, um, you've got it, Anne, you take it from here, and I'm not going to be on, on any of the meetings, et cetera, that's a sign to me that this part of that student is going to be a real challenge because the parent usually needs to play some type of a role, whether that's driving the student to things whether it's helping using your own family's resources to connect the student. Uh, you know, whatever that ends up being, and it's unique to each student, this chart often has a lot to do with the family's connectedness or, you, you know, a company like Ivy Compass and me offering and providing and sharing what the opportunities are. But um, so what we can we can share more. So what this all results in, right? So I showed you two charts. And they had numbers on the sides. So we've got one through eight on our academic chart and one through eight on our personal chart. And so at the end of 10th grade, I have enough information to give a bit of a, a rating to the student. And I go in and I, I, I map it all out here and, and, and I share it with the student and the family and I show you where the student is at that point. And also that meeting is a lot about where I predict the student will go if they're able to accomplish my suggestions and the strategies that I'm offering. And then what that means is at the end of 10th grade, this is what a, a this is what a college list looks like from me. They're not three categories. It's not here are your safeties, here's your sweet spot, and here are your reaches. You see here three, four, 
five, six, seven categories. Um, and I apologize for this annoying red thing not stopping. So if you get if your student gets a rating um, of a, a say an 11, which is a common rating here, they have a 40 to 60% chance to be admitted to the schools in my system that are 11s. They have a 30 to 50% chance of being admitted to the schools in my system that are at 12. And then they have almost no chance of being admitted to the schools that are at that are a 13, which would be here in this difficult category. Now, what we end up doing is strategizing and saying, okay, if the student is an 11 or we're predicting the student is an 11, how can we use things like early action and early decision to kind of creep over here and increase chances of a student being able to be admitted to these more difficult schools or possibly into difficult? And so what we end up seeing is that rarely do students are they able to increase their rating, my rating of them by more than two points for sure. Um, but also it takes some strategy to figure out the best way to um, get into some of these more difficult schools. Likewise, on the other side of things, solid chance, strong chance, very good, excellent are our safety schools, but they're also um, schools that sometimes have a program or a, um, an offering that's unique and that the student's really interested in. And so those, those schools are actually on the list with purpose. They're there for a reason. And the other part is because if you are an 11 here in the purple category, there's a good chance you'll get merit scholarship if you apply to schools in the orange category and the gray category. And so then the student is starting to look at being admitted into an honors college for a public university or an honors program um, for a private university, whatever honors program they're offering. And that often comes with very uh, major perks, including merit scholarships and unique learning environments, access to um, better dorms, better um, a, a cohort of students to enter with. It often means that they have better access to professors, even if it's a larger university, lots of neat things happen if a student can um, take advantage of some of the schools in this area. And this is an example of what um, some of the schools in the rating system look like. So I used 11 as an example, and that would be a pretty selective school. By the way, NYU is more now of a 12. Over just the last year, it's popped into being a 12. Um, and Duke is sort of popping up into a 14. Um, and so, you know, no surprise, as I mentioned, you've heard of all of these schools most likely. Princeton and Stanford, Harvard, they're all the super selective schools, Penn. Then we've got just, just the littlest bit less selective, Northwestern, Duke, et cetera. We've got UVA, Carnegie Mellon, other 12s that are very popular are Boston University, Boston College. Um, Northeastern in Boston is also here in a 13. We've got NYU, which I mentioned has just gotten incredibly popular and it's, it's moving up into a 12. Lehigh, a very popular engineering school in Pennsylvania is an 11. Uh, BU's a 10, BU's not a 10 anymore. Sorry, I should have updated this. It's popped up into the 11 range. Pitt, Fordham, you see here. And here's my, here's Rutgers, right a mile from me is a seven. Um, and yet these schools offer, especially these schools down here, people very often because of the quote unquote prestige factor, sort of dismiss or look at these schools as safeties. And in fact, they are offering amazing educations, amazing programs, really unique things that uh, may be really appealing to your student as they pursue a certain um, area of study. So um, that's what the rating system looks like. So that's a pretty invaluable process. Um, I, I rate a student in 10th grade, and then um, that is a very helpful to have a college list at the end of 10th grade, because my, which I'll get into, approach is in, in a lot of ways, people never see themselves as a consumer in this dynamic. And you are, in fact, a consumer. You are choosing to pay money to send your child to a college. And it's important that the student start to take control of that decision because they are going to be the ones at this place for four years. 
So the reason I start sharing the list in 10th grade at the end of 10th grade is for the you, the family and the student to start to understand what these schools have to offer, to go visit them, to drive through them, to um, get back to me and say, hey, we're going to this city where, what should we go look at? And I let you know. And I want students by the time they're through 11th grade to really know what this whole, this is about and to be really informed consumers so they know what this is and they know what they're getting into and they're getting the most out of it. So that's kind of another part of college admissions that's rarely talked about is positioning the student as the person who is, should be uh, an informed uh, participant and really doing their own research and their own understanding of what college is like. And that's what I find it very, that's a big part of me helping my students. So, um, you know, uh, Sophia and Ivy Compass, of course, everybody wants to know, like, what, what do you do here? Let me see these, you know, I gotta, sorry, I have a bunch of things showing up on my screen. I have to move them around. Okay. So I wanna give a couple um, examples of two students that I counseled. So student one was a young woman um, in New York City, and she be, she came to me in about 10th grade, and she had a 10 rating. So she these are, again, those categories. Um, these numbers here are the, the rating numbers. So she was doing a little Model UN. Oh, wait. Uh, so no, sorry. This is a young man from New Jersey, came to me in 10th grade, um, had a 10 rating. He was involved in Model UN and had been in his town's mayor's council. He had a he was about a four. Uh, so so personally, he was about a four or five. He was starting to move into the five zone. He had a couple major interests. Some were kind of quirky, like this tabletop gaming, arts, music, songwriting. You see that, but not not always. Um, environmental issues and sort of a government and politics interest. And then his academic rating was a six overall. So you can see here, he's about a 10. And so we put together a strategy that he would really start to pursue opportunities, again, above and beyond what the school or the local environment has to offer. And he was able to apply and be admitted to the an international model UN conference twice, once in 10th grade and once in 11th. So he went to Mexico. And he also was admitted to, a, you know, it was a selective, a, the congressperson that represented his district, he was a member of that advisory council. So here we go from a mayor's council to a congressperson's council. So there's a step up. He took his storytelling, songwriting Eve stuff and started to sort of um, uh, formalize it in that he became editor in chief of the school newspaper. And that was the formalizing of the storytelling hobbies. And then he took on an, a leadership role um, in, in the environmental club just at a moment. This was just luck where the um, uh, all of the um, climate marches were happening, which was a couple of years ago. And so he really stepped into a leadership role, organizing the march, uh, speaking in front of his school, speaking in front of his town and um, marching to the congressperson's office. TV coverage, this big event that he played a really big role in. And that was just kind of an opportunity that came along that he jumped in, got support from family, got support from the school to make happen. And so he was able to move from a 10 rating um, to a 12, um, kind of a light 12, I would say. And it was also in COVID where he didn't have any a chance for any ACT tests. So he had registered for five SATs, was never able to take one, but he did, he was an AP scholar. He had taken, uh, because of again, scheduling issues, which we had mapped out ahead of time, he was kind of jammed up in his schedule, but was able to take two AP classes in his 10th grade year. So he actually had a little more um, rigor in his academic work by the time he was getting into his senior year. And he was an AP scholar by the time he was applying, which means you've taken a certain number of APs and you've scored certain grades in them, certain sc test scores. So he was one of these students who, know, despite my best efforts to try to get some selection going, um, he did not use ED 
EA, early decision, early action. And instead he did um, only regular, he did early action and regular decision. And he was admitted to Boston University, which is a, uh, well, at this time it's about an 11, Boston College, which is a 12, GW, and then the Rutgers Honors Program, as I mentioned. So he was an in-state student to Rutgers Honors, Pro Honors Program. Um, oops, hold on one sec. So this is kind of what he looked like um, on the application. So these were the three areas, government and politics, storytelling, and environmentalism. So, you know, he was a model UN, he had leadership, attended those conferences. I've mentioned these um, advisory councils. And then his academic, and this often happens, you'll see that the student, this is what I try to do with students, is is have their personal stuff connect with their academic. So this person's interested in government and politics, getting sort of a real experience in it. And he's got courses to back it up. He's got a push and he's got AP Gov. Um, and so that's a really neat connection and it can get greater than just this. You know, it, there could be, there could have been more. And then we've got storytelling. We've got the editor in chief of the newspaper, this Dungeons and Dragons, which by the way, is a storytelling tabletop game. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's all about storytelling. Um, he worked at the library, another kind of connected uh, thing here, graphic novel, comic book, songwriting and poetry, author himself, unpublished. And then he took two Columbia classes, pre-college courses, um, both in journalism and persuasive writing. And then he took two of the AP English courses. And then lastly, we've got the Environmental Club. He was a leader in that, led the climate march and the connection was the AP bio class. So that's a kid who, a student who is a, can actively in their application be talking about what they care about and how they are pursuing it in a scholarly way, you know, and connecting between um, but what they've learned and how they're living that out in the real world. And that is a really important part of this process. The next student um, is, a, is the girl I mentioned from New York. And in 10th grade, she had an 11. She, was, um, she went to a, a nice competitive school with a good reputation in New York City. She was into um, newspaper also, social justice, tutoring and wildlife. And then she had an overall six academically. The strategy for her, because we were coming out of COVID at this time, I laid out a bunch of options and she really took this tutoring thing and ran with it. I've not counseled many students who worked as hard as this student did to produce such an impactful program uh, in her out of school time. And so she was, it began, it was a neat story and it ended up being her essay as well, that she started by tutoring a single person and she was a Spanish speaker or kind of, and he was, and then it moved into creating a tutoring program that served hundreds of students, involved many of her high school student friends in doing this and worked with actual administrators at schools to provide support for students over Zoom across multiple languages, multiple grades. It was gigantic. Um, in addition, she became editor-in-chief of her newspaper. Um, she had a minor social justice thing happening. But then we actually, she spent the summer before 11th grade. I didn't think her kind of wildlife and uh, environmental stuff was going to be big enough. But she chose to go to Costa Rica the summer after her 11th grade year and actually do oceanic research. And so those things were really uh, great. She also, and you can't, you know, there's only so much you can do about this. She scored a 36 ACT. And then she was an ED. It, she used the ED strategy to Duke. So again, this tutoring was huge. I can talk more about that in the Q&A to give you a sense of its scope. Um, you know, the wildlife conservation. And again, many of these focuses start with something small and the student takes the initiative to go bigger and bigger with that thing over time. So the expectation that your ninth grader is going to do a huge thing is very unlikely. The ninth grade year would be for getting, getting out there, getting interested in things, and then figuring out which ones to keep at. 
And so in this case, it was the tutoring was the one, the huge one. The wildlife conservation became very interesting. And so the academic connectedness to uh, the wildlife conservation was, you know, her research in Costa Rica during doing marine bi biology. And then academically, she was, she had a whole series of courses around that, including fluency in Spanish, marine biology at Brown's pre-college, global studies, environmental, um, living environmental lab, et cetera. Her, her, her school, by the way, didn't do a ton of APs. That's why they're not on here. And then she had a, an interesting story to tell about her identity. She has very Southern roots in South Carolina, North Carolina, and she's a Brooklyn transplant. And there's a whole bunch of political and life things that she went with there. Um, and one thing also about Duke, that is, this is the, the, the kind of final piece of the puzzle here um, for the application process, is Duke has an oceanic um, marine biology center on the coast of North Carolina. And so knowing about, they also have a lemur center in at Duke. They do actually have a lot of marine. So this was her dream school, but it also worked because it aligned already with what she was interested in. Now, she didn't say, oh, Duke, I want to go to Duke and Duke has wildlife, marine biology, this stuff. I'm going to start pursuing that. Instead, this was actually that wildlife conservation was something she was very passionate about. And Duke, because you know, had it as most, most schools did. They have it a little more than other places. And so she, we were able to make that a real connection. And that's the kind of question of like, what's the major of the student? Or what can we propose the major will be? And how much of their actual academic and non-academic time supports that major. And that's kind of a work in progress as you get into 11th grade. So that's what that's, this was what the student looked like. Um, uh, one second. So how I work, which I've started to talk about a little bit. Um, one, one sec, one sec. Um, is probably a bit similar to other college uh, counselors if we've chatted with them. So um, everything is completely unique to the student. I have a structure that I operate in, a system that I use, but everything is customized for the student that I work with. There is no one size fits all college uh, consulting system for me anyway. It is getting to know the student and being responsive to what that student's interested in and formatting a plan and strategy or coaching to maximize that student's academic and personal profiles for the most success. Um, so I, I think that there are probably counselors who are what I would call prescribing how to do things like you will now go do this and this and this. And, um, I recommend is more a more accurate way of talking about what I do because I want to take what's what the student is already doing and make it more as opposed to saying you need to become a different person. I never say that. I never suggest things that a student isn't actually already interested in. And it the system works much better that way because the student is much happier and much more engaged. So I do all of the grade level strategies. Um, we 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 begin with you know depending on the grade, getting to know uh, the student really well and starting to move for this process through um, suggestions and strategies and plans and all the components of what's needed for the application. Um, core, as I mentioned before, course selection is big and summer is big in this whole process, and then mentioning again at the end of 10th grade and then revisiting it in 11th grade and on is the college list. Um, so as I mentioned, it's the system, um, oop, sorry, that fulfills the um, academic potential, but still ensuring choice. And that starts in 10th at the end of 10th grade. Application strategic positioning is me, as you saw from those two student examples, is figuring out what the student's interested in, getting them to do it at a larger and larger, deeper level, and then using um, the application to bring out the best of all of that, to create what I call threads through the student 
between their academic, extracurricular, personal sometimes connectedness um, to showcase them as a really um, um, engaged uh, academic mind who will contribute at a college campus. And then um, lastly, and probably one of the most time consuming parts of this in the end is the application management process where we're um, managing deadlines and essays and doing all the pieces of the puzzle that is getting applications in on time, proofread in perfect condition, um, and then managing and helping the student manage all the other pieces of that process. I will share that this whole process, this application process plus management process for a student, I, I think of accurate description of that for a, a student who's entering senior year is, is saying to them, this amount of work is the same as an AP class, at least for the fall. And so that's the kind of expectation that the student can carve out enough time as they would dedicate to an AP class to do the actual application process for, for all the colleges. Um, so the other piece that I have been told is a bit different that I offer is what I call an attribute-based approach. So what I, I um, want to take what the student is curious about um, and engaged in already and move that into um, deeper engagement. And uh, in ninth grade, my, my advice is to be curious and to take and engage in lots of things and be a busy, active ninth grader and you know, sign up for clubs, do activities. Not all of those activities are gonna make it onto your college application, but you'll pick the ones that you like and you'll stick to with them and we'll figure out how to deepen and grow that engagement beyond the school as time goes by. And so I use, we use strategies like pre-college courses, internships, research, all of that stuff to deepen the engagement. As you saw from the two student examples, I look for about three areas of interest to show this deep, deep rich engagement. I think that, and what, what all the research shows and all the interviews you read from college counselors, I mean, admissions officers, is that they are looking for students who are deeply engaged. Um, if a student is so deeply engaged that it's only one or two things, that's okay too, as long as it's to a, a depth level of true, you know, true authentic engagement. And so again, as I mentioned, we weave together the academic extracurricular and unique qualities of a student to put that into the application. So this is like a super engaging person. And then we optimize, we figure out how to um, showcase all of this in addition with optional recommendations, supplemental essays that are part of the application, honors and activities. Um, and I'll share, you know, one, one, another piece of this whole process that I think gets overlooked is um, often the, the, school. So so in, I'll just give, tell you an inside scoop here at Princeton, where I read, when you read uh, applications for students, you kind of have to pitch them to the committee to say why they're good candidates to be admitted to Princeton. And it's your job to kind of help that student put their best foot forward. And one thing that gets lost in the shuffle, I think, in the college application process is that admissions perspective that, that I'm trying to put with that student onto paper, onto the application, I'm trying to sort of feed the admissions officer that argument. And I'm saying, you know, here's Jane, the student in New York, who is going to be, you know, I want, I want to give that admissions officer in the application what should be written to support her moving forward. And in that case, this is like, whoa, this is someone who stepped up in a big, big way, organized, connected with young people, you know, used a personal experience to motivate her to make a huge impact on a lot of students' lives. This is gonna be a person at Duke who gets involved. This is gonna be a person who is, you know, kind of trying to juggle community service here with this really cool interest in marine biology. This is a person who is going to really connect with people. 
Um, and I happen to know Duke has a whole north south thing. It's a cultural challenge at that particular campus. And here's someone who has a north south experience. She has southern, very southern roots and very northern living experience. Won't she be an interesting person to kind of build these bridges between the north south issues that happen at Duke? And so that's another attribute based approach that I'm always looking for is how is this going to land? with that admissions officer, are we giving that person enough to advocate in the ways we want them to for the student to be moved on to the next level in the process? So kind of nuts and bolts here, I do, um, you know, depending on the year that the student is engaged with me, we do Zoom check-in meetings in which we're um, going over things like course, course selection, extracurricular strategies, summer planning, um, and that gets more intense as time goes by. Um, I offer um, the part I mentioned about the student being um, an informed consumer. Um, is this how to choose a college and tips and advice and college 101 sessions where when I start with a student in, say, ninth and 10th grade, I do I tack on to our check in meetings, little sessions where the student can better understand what college actually is, how colleges operate, what do colleges offer that are of interest to that student, how is college different than high school. Likewise, I have a testing 101 so that they, before they start testing, they can understand what these tests are actually about, how they're structured, what coursework needs to be covered before you start test taking. Um, so I, I have a library of these, um, of these 101s, I call them, and they, they're really helpful to students. I get a lot of feedback that many students, especially the oldest child in a family or um, students whose parents did not go to college in the United States, um, they understand that college is this big thing, but they, they need to be more informed in order to make smarter decisions. Like many of them don't know what a liberal arts college is. They don't know uh, actually what engineering technically is um, because engineering really doesn't happen in high school. Um, that they can go to a specific technical college around that, um, art schools, all of that stuff, we get into the details of it. And we also get into the details of how to choose a college. Well, as students are in 11th grade, the beginning of 11th grade, I feel that they're in a place where they can start to say, this is what I'm looking for in college. I care about the career. I care about, you know, um, um, what what resources are available? Can I do, be in a research lab that has certain type of equipment, you know, or is there is there um, I'm really interested in, um, you know, physics and or molecular biology. What's that actual program like at a college? And so the how to choose a college program that I offer as part of of, of my consulting helps students better understand what they care about. And it also helps them define how to figure out what colleges offer those things and other parts of what they are looking for in a college experience. Um, my timeline, uh, again, is probably pretty similar. In grades nine and 10, we do check-in meetings maybe every six weeks, college 101s. Um, we do PSAT tips and practice, uh, course selection, as I mentioned, summer planning, and then grade, after grade 10, there's a rating and a rating presentation that I give to the student and family. Um, in grade 11, we really, it gets busy. We do monthly check-ins and then a couple other times we connect. Um, and by the way, when I say check-ins and monthly meetings, I set official meetings, but I'm available through text and email or to jump on the phone or another Zoom call whenever it's needed. Um, but we just try to map out a schedule to be consistent. And then, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm often in touch with people in between figuring out this, that, or the other thing. So in grade 11, we're doing definitely monthly, if not slightly more check-ins, more college 101s and how to choose a college. The PSAT and testing is really underway by then, if not sooner. We've got grade 12 course selection, super important, AP test prep. We do the college, the um, teacher and guidance recommendation. A lot of that is going on in 11th grade, summer planning, which I start even in December of uh, grade 11. 
so that the summer after grade 11, they're really lined up with um, a, a really great engaging summer. Um, we rerun the rating at the end of grade 11 to a final college list. Um, and then in the summer, we do all the essay, all the application work um, as much as possible. Usually my students are really busy in the summer. They're doing all the things that we organized and did to have them, you know, they're traveling around the world or really deep in an internship or doing research or all of those things. And so despite my best efforts to get people to do their application early, I totally understand and respect that they are working really hard at important things over their summer. And it doesn't matter, I make it work on anybody's schedule. So then we, we get really busy as soon as they're available to get busy. All of the application stuff gets done. And, and October is the busiest time because most of my students, because I advise them to, are have picked an early decision college. And that is super, super important in this that they have. And that's why we start the college list in, at the end of 10th grade. They have time to sort through, to be an informed consumer, and with my guidance, pick a school that is a little bit of a stretch for early decision. It's pushing them a little bit, you know, to a more competitive school, but that is a really important decision that the student, that I advise students to commit to. Not all of them do, and also for legit reasons, they do not. But October is super busy because if they're not going early decision, they're definitely going early action to a bunch of schools. And so we really are just meeting every week in October, if not slightly more, um, you know, in, uh, essays and things going back and forth. And then um, once that weird period between November 1st and December happens where early decision and some early action replies come back, then we have to kind of reconnect and decide what happens next if the student didn't get admitted to that school, to their ED school. Then there's a reshuffling and we, we get back to it. And I follow the student all the way until they accept an offer. So I am available. We go through the entire application process as long as that takes. We have sometimes a re a re-meeting where we reshuffle some things depending on how it went in the first round. And then I have even been on the phone with a student the day before on the last April 30th, as they were going to make the decision that night um, because they couldn't decide between a couple of schools that they'd been admitted to and they called me and I was happy to talk to them. I don't, I don't think I actually helped um, except to say you have, you better decide pretty quickly. Um, that student ended up going to USC, very happy there. Um, so, so I'm in it till the very bitter end um, and happy to be part of any anything there, uh, including I have a whole decision matrix analysis for students who are really bogged down with the decision and can't decide. Um, the good news in all of this I will share because I know it's all very overwhelming is it works out. It always works out and it works out really well. Um, and so students, the vast majority of my students are very happy at the colleges that they, that mutually accept each other, um, and they're going on to do really exciting things. So, and that is it. That is my presentation. <laughs>